everyone. My name is Nadia Helene, the Marketing Manager here at The Joyce. I am honored to be joined by Body Traffic Artistic Director, Tina Finkelman Burkett, Amadi Washington, and Sam Pratt, who make up the choreographic and performing entity of Valle and Asa. So first off, I wanted to congratulate you all Thank for you. a wonderful opening night last Thank night. You. Thank you so much. And I think it's a wonderful way to start off our own joy spring and summer season with this particular collection of works, which span genre and style, and I think also speaks a lot to the mission and nature of Body Traffic's work as a company. Totally. So we have works by these two, mm -hmm. and also former Body Traffic dancer Michaela Taylor, Alejandro Cerrito, who premiered a evening life work with us last fall, and uh, Fernando Fernando Madigan. Mm -hmm. So Tina, I'm curious about how you go about building these connections uh, for the company and what draws you to a particular piece of repertory or to new choreographers. Yeah, thanks for asking that. And we're so happy to be with you, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm looking, well, I'm always looking for new choreographic voices. And since I started the company, it's really always been with a pretty clear eye for what would we as a collective like to do as dancers. So what would feel good as dancers? What would we really enjoy performing many times because the nature of having a touring rep repertory company is that you end up doing pieces a lot of times, which is great. And so what will we enjoy coming back to rediscovering over and over again? And what what works or what choreographic voices can kind of stand the test of time? You know, work that feels substantial and current, but also has kind of like a timeless way about it. And so I found the work of these two lovely people during an online film festival. Yeah, the Blacklight yeah, Summit. The Blacklight Summit, yeah. yes. So, and actually I was, I was on that uh, evening watching Michaela's work and then their work came on and I just was completely blown away for those very reasons. I was like, this feels totally timeless and incredibly fresh and current. And I felt as a dancer, like I would want to learn from those people. I would want to feel what that feels like. And it would just feel incredible to share it with the world and do it on stage. And so that's kind of the lens through which I'm looking for work and how this evening in particular, certainly every one of those pieces, I feel like the dancers love getting into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's a wonderful way to approach commissioning new works. And it requires a lot of foresight from your perspective to see the works and to see the movement languages that will uh, be relevant and, and touch audiences and the dancers for um, for this time and onward. Yeah. yeah. And Sam and Mari, would you mind giving us a little bit of your origin story? Um, because you're both childhood friends and dancers in your own right. So what drives your uh, choreographic um, work as a duo? We, uh, we met each other when we were six years old and um, we took our first dance class together with this man named Jamal Jackson who came to the premiere last night, but he is okay. largely responsible uh, for why we dance. Um, he taught us an African dance class and we studied a bit about Western, uh, West African dance forms and it gave us a relationship to rhythm. It gave us a relationship to effort that we carry with us into the way we approach contemporary dance and theater. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's kind of the start of our dancing relationship that maybe we can talk more about. I think in terms of what we're interested in making and yeah. the kind of stuff we focus on, um, we're both very interested in politics and we both didn't go to conservatories and so we were trained in a more uh general way i was studying philosophy amadi was studying other things besides dance in college as well and so that has kind of opened up our interest to things outside of the studio and uh, you know history literature all those things and those things inform our personal conversations and the things we care about personally are the things we often try to tackle in our work not only because we feel it's, you know, important, but it's the things that we care about. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's the things that feel challenging. Uh, so often, dance is so wonderful for the dancer and there's so much to just sort of sensorily experience in the body. Um, but then it also has this incredibly powerful, you know, way to storytell. And so we, uh, 
we really try to sink our teeth into these issues that we can sort of speak about rhetorically and also speak about to the body on stage. And, and I'll add to that that you know we've spent a lot of time making duet work together, and so when we're making work with each other and on each other, our identities are inextricably attached to the story that we are trying to tell as a black man, white man, uh, Jewish man. Um, we have different upbringings from different places, although we're both from New York City. Um, and so that influences the narrative that we depict as a duo. And Tina gave us this amazing opportunity to work with Body Traffic. Um, and it's our first time setting work on a rep company where you know, we don't really have a choice of the circumstance of the dancers, um, how much attention we can give the piece compared to how we usually work together. Um, and so it, it gave us a new challenge. It gave us a new way mm -hmm. of uh, having to prepare rather than exploring. We had to consolidate information and bring it <laughs> to a group of people um, in the most packaged way that we could because, uh, you know, the, the ideas that we like to speak towards are important to us. And so you can't just show up in the studio from that perspective and just say, okay, what do we want to do today? Right. Which we're able to do sometimes with each other. Yes, yes, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. And with this particular piece for body traffic, can you speak to the impetus of the themes and ideas that are present in the work? Yeah, uh, we read a book uh, called The Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe, who is a journalist and author for The New Yorker. Um, and it is... A History of the Sackwood Family, which is a quite well-known, uh, largely responsible for the opioid epidemic mm -hmm. in this country, and also large philanthropical arts donation family uh, in New York. Their name is plastered all over major New York art institutions, although that has sort of started to come down. The Met just took it down. Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, uh, there is, so that was our, that was our starting point. And that is the narrative that the dancers have on stage. And so we wanted to give them a clear story, almost a script so that they understand, the dancers on stage understand how relationships operate, how status operates, how they're relating to one another on stage. Mm -hmm. But we're not so much concerned that the audience understand that it's about the Sackwood family. Mm -hmm. And this narrative that we've created is hopefully a larger allegorical sort of story for, you know, that could encompass, I don't know, this the cigarette industry lying to the public in the seventies about not causing cancer, the oil, oil industry, industry lying yeah. to the public about, you know, oh, it doesn't cause climate change. CO2 emissions don't cause, don't cause climate change. So it's like, it's the ways in which power corrupts, the ways in which corporate entities hoard resources and the ways in which the fallout of those decisions often affect a citizenry. And, uh, you know, the Sackler family started with a patriarch, uh, a kind of humble beginnings, American dream type of story, a man named Ar Arthur Sackler, who created the drugs uh, Valium and Librium, which a lot of people know as, you know, both pain and mental health relief sort of drugs that were used in the mid 20th century, but also caused a lot of people to get addicted and die. Um, and that sort of lineage was passed down to the next generation. Um, this idea that you can sell a product with uh, misleading ideas about what it actually is and what it can do to you, um, and then continue to make money off of that, even when people find out, even when judges and politicians and people know you can continue to profit off of that mm -hmm. exploitation, that death that you've caused. Um, and so like Sam said, it's the piece is an allegorical depiction of what happens when the endless pursuit of profit uh, takes over maybe what was once a noble cause. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, you know, the cause isn't noble. Sometimes businesses do just want to take advantage of people. Um, and we gave the dancers this story so that they had the ability to connect to something as characters on the stage. But we also wanted to make a, a piece that uh, gave us the opportunity to explore our movement language as dancers with a new group of people for the mm -hmm. first time. And that was really exciting to just have the opportunity to do yeah. and dance i mean dance like we want to recognize dance's power to like to liberate thought in specific ideas and thesis into indeterminacy and the ambiguity that exists in movement and dance and the way that can it can be experienced does not have to be overly didactic mm -hmm. and even we, we wanted to have clarity for the dancers but for the audience mm -hmm. 
we want them to be able to see all of these other layers, hopefully, and not have to arrive at a singular thesis mm -hmm. and not even have the same information that we're giving to you right now in this talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that, Dan. That's mm -hmm. a really good thought, mm -hmm. especially because seeing part of the work yesterday and during the dress run, um, it really does speak to a sort of universal experience of power dynamics mm -hmm. and the exploitation of those power dynamics that can be translated in one's own personal experience mm -hmm. to anything like you mentioned, the cigarette industry and other mm -hmm. um, other conglomerates that sort of rule our social systems. Mm. Um, and I'm curious also because Atina mentioned earlier that a lot of your work started and is still rooted in dance film um, and the exploration of movement through the lens of the camera, how your experience working in that realm has translated into working for work on stage. Yeah, I mean, you know, because we are interested in politics, because we are interested in telling stories about people and uh, things that happen in the real world, inevitably that translates to film. And I think uh, it's a natural place for us to be. We see a lot of dance film and um, the way that dance is off often captured on film is to capture the dance. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great, I think you know, dance can be used in a lot of ways to display the human body, to display a beautiful landscape with a person in front of it and be in awe of the presence of nature and body in form. Um, but we use dance film to dig a layer deeper and explore these narratives that we want to portray. And we strongly believe that dance film is very untapped in a lot of ways. Um, we made a film a few years ago called Second Seed. Uh, that's a film that Tina first saw. Um, and Second Seed is a response to D.W. Griffith's 1915 silent film, The Birth of a Nation, which is known as a kind of xenophobic uh, attack on Black people in the early 20th century, basically giving a justification to the KKK by uh, showing Black people as animals and um, in, a, in a really evil light in the post-Civil War era during Reconstruction. Um, and so, you know, we took a really large piece of source material, kind of distilled it into a live performance and duet at first, and then explored it through an evening length group piece, and then eventually thought it made sense to make it into a film because it was a silent film, and silent film is dance film, and dance film is silent mm -hmm. film. And um, to try to relate these two realms uh, is something that I think is going to take a hold of our industry, especially since COVID. Um, it's put people in the virtual world more. It's going to take more and more of a hold of our industry. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that? Time exists in a really cool way in film. Mm -hmm. I, there's a there's a there's a linear experience to watching something in the theater. You arrive, you sit down, it happens, it's over. <laughs> You're experiencing yeah. time linear in a linear way when you sit down at a live performance. And we love live performance, and we'll continue to engage with live performance in our careers. But there's something uh, about the way that one can manipulate time in film that is super exciting for us mm -hmm. as live performance artists mm -hmm. and we'll continue to also experiment with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Tina, I'm curious for this particular work, um, what the rehearsal process was like since the piece was first set and now you're taking it on tour and now it's here sure. at Boy, um, how the company continues to grapple with those ideas that um, these two have kind of been set into the film. Yeah, well, first of all, these two were remarkably prepared. It was unbelievable, like they described to you, but really when they came to work with the company, I mean, we talked beforehand about what, you know, they might want to be discussing in the work at large, but I had no idea until maybe the week before, like really how much they were diving in. And it was so impressive and really inspiring for me. You know, having commissioned so many works, it was really notable to see the work they put in before they ever stepped into the studio. And so I feel like the work is so rich, you know, because of all of the clarity and intention and stories that, that's there that the dancers are, you know, have access to. Mm -hmm. And they also offered the dancers a number of source materials from TV shows to films to the book itself that they, you know, that they reference often. And so the dancers... Whenever we're about to revisit the work, we're reminding them, you know, to revisit the source materials if there's something they haven't watched yet or if they want to dive into the book, which is a little lengthy. <laughs> but, um, 
you know, we're encouraging them to dig a layer deeper and see how they can further enhance their participation in the piece because mm -hmm. the more that they know about this story and what has happened and the impact it's had on the world, the deeper they can dive into their character. And you just see, you know, for instance, Tiare, who plays this kind of antagonist, mm -hmm. um, the more she knows about the character she's portraying, it just allows her access to, you know, different layers of nuance in, in her performance because she's, you know, she's tapping into a very detailed story that, as they described, maybe at times felt like it was a um, a worthy cause, but mm -hmm. then is go takes very dark turns. Mm -hmm. And the more that she kind of explores this, the more we see her character evolve and feel um, super compelling. Mm -hmm. So so that's the first thing is we're reminding the dancers, go back to these things that are available to you, see what, what more you can learn. And then of course, like, you know, my job always entails, there's, the process of making sure that the company has a cohesive approach and way of performing the work that really upholds the intention of their movement. You know, there's there's a clear movement vocabulary, which is one of the reasons I love their work. Mm -hmm. And how does the company continue to get clear? You know, sometimes last week, for instance, I said to them, okay, it's been a few weeks since you've either seen Sam or Amadi or interacted with them. So should we call upon some videos of their work? Probably you guys don't even know this. <laughs> so should we call upon some videos of the two of them? You know, it's amazing that they're actively performing their own work. So we get to look right at the actual source doing their movement. And what are like the little, you know, um, the, the little shapes and ways that are specific to the way that the two of them move that are so clear in their work. I'm trying to think of some examples. Mm -hmm. But there, there's something about how percussive they are and how specific and how much emotion comes in and how much intensity that the company has to keep honing in on and mm -hmm. developing. And these are kind of the things we're working on as a group to further it more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And since the company is based in LA and you two are here in New York, um, I guess, are, have there been any new discoveries that you've been sharing with the company now that you're all together again here in one place? Well, there's been a little bit of time that Sam was actually able to have back in LA since the first time we went there. I got COVID, so I wasn't able to go. Uh, but, you know, that's the way the world is right now. Yes. But, um, you know, I think having space for the dancers is important because something that was hard to remember when you're first there making the piece, and that's still a hard pill to swallow sometimes, is that like, there's a lot of other things on their mind. There's a lot of other pieces on their mind. And Tina will tell you that is no excuse for performing <laughs> our work in <laughs> any different sort of way than what we intend. But that is that is a reality. They're, sure. they're touring the country. I'll admit it's reality. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, they are touring the country and they're doing a lot of other pieces. And so there's only so much access that we have to them and there's only so much access they have in their brains to continue to revisit the same information yeah. as frequently as we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, working with that distance has um, kind of forced us actually just to be on our computers more, watching video of the dancers, requesting items yeah. from Tina, requesting time from Tina uh, in her rehearsals with the dancers so that we have the ability to just stay connected. Even if it's even if it's the smallest bit, um, you know, there's only so many things we can tell her and that she can repeat to them. And, but hearing it from the source is different. And so, you know, we have uh, we definitely want to stay in contact with the people who are in the work. Mm -hmm. um, and we intend to continue to stay in of contact course. with the people who are in That's the work. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, this is this is kind of typical of how the rep lives on and how we uphold that integrity for each choreographer. You know, for instance, today, Guzman, our artistic associate, will spend time, you know, cutting the video from last night, sending it to the various choreographers, having them look not just at the dancing, but the technical elements and understand, mm -hmm. get some notes, make sure that we're constantly representing them at the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. So, so to Amadi's point, we've been a lot of video exchange yeah, and then yeah, converse, yeah. conversations yeah. about those yes, videos. Yes, yeah. Definitely. But the distance is not, I mean, the distance actually creates an intensive period for me in my experience that I go to LA, 
I don't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. I'm there to work on the piece mm -hmm. with the dancers, as opposed to being in New York where you're like, oh, I got this thing, then I'm running around here, and then like maybe four hours in the afternoon. So it's like it actually sort of divides the mind in a clearer way. Yes. And I think the thing that I'm noticing that is the most difficult about uh, this piece and in this within this rep company structure is that we had this like incredible month where we're there immersed in this world together, thinking about these ideas, the implications of these ideas in the world and how those things are expanding and still rapidly changing. The FDA is literally changing rules about these drugs right now. Institutions are taking these names off their walls right now and then to do it in 22 minutes on stage right and like the, the the ways that like our ambitions and the challenge of talking about these things uh how that lives in a 22 minute concert dance piece mm -hmm. um so i think more than the distance it's it's more about the relationships of those kind of things well thank you so so much for giving us an inside look behind the scenes to the creation of the work the continuation of the yeah. work um, I hope that everyone at home has had or will have a chance to see this work live as well as the three other pieces that Body Traffic Thank is you. performing this week. Um, and of course, please stay connected uh, to Body Traffic and by Anissa um, through The Choice, through their website, social media, everything, uh, and keeping these connections going into the future. Thank you so much Thank for you joining so much us. For Thank you so much.